the Carvera Air Desktop CNC has reached the production stage. And importantly, they finally released Makeara Cam. So let's see how the machine has improved and how well hardware and software work together. I've given good reviews of Carvera desktop CNC machines so far, but a sticking point for me has been the ongoing coming soon status of the accompanying CAM software. So when they wanted me to review the production Carvera Air, I said I wouldn't even get started until Makera CAM was properly released. Finally, here we are. Makera has sent this machine to me for free and it has been tested in accordance with my review policy and will be donated to a local school once this video goes out. Briefly, the Carvera Air is a desktop CNC machine that retails for two and a half thousand US dollars. And that is expensive, but it is less than half the price of the flagship model. Previously, I tested the prototype version of the Carvera Air, and I've linked that video below in case you wanted some details on the setup, the reasons the Air is cheaper than the regular Carvera, such as using a wired AVL probe instead of a wireless one, a slightly smaller working volume, no automatic tool changer in favor of a manual quick action system, no built-in vacuum, and making things like the laser a paid add-on rather than being included in the machine. In that video, I also went through all of the demonstration projects, so please check it out by following the link if you want to see what the typical user experience is like for a beginner. In this video, I am reviewing the production model, but I'm not going to repeat all of those previous steps. You can rest assured that performance is the same as before, and I've been able to do my usual jobs of cutting carbon fiber sheet and aluminium. So instead, in this video, we're going to focus on the improvements that have been made to the machine and particularly the software side. Compared to the pre-production Kickstarter version that I tested, I'm pleased to report there has been a range of upgrades. So let's briefly go through them one by one. For the closed loop steppers, we can see an additional module on the back of the stepper and additional wires heading to this. This should stop skip steps and ensure more accuracy. One of my complaints about the prototype's lid was that it flexed too much and the seal was peeling off. The production version is injection molded and therefore has some thicker ribbed sections. The new design is a lot more rigid and the thicker lip gives you a lot more to grab with your fingers. Furthermore, the whole hinge design of the door has changed. Whereas previously it had to lift straight up, which took up quite a lot of vertical space, now it slides back and sits a bit lower. The previous dust shoe was 3D printed and it had a pretty awkward mounting system where you needed to slot it in from the right angle to wedge it underneath a raised bolt. The shoe is now injection molded and has a simple magnetic mounting system. You just lift it up from underneath and it will attach by itself. The adjustable air assist system is clearly in place with an output that you can point towards the tip of the tool and a quick pneumatic fitting on the back that you can attach to a compressor output. The fourth axis previously used a belt and pulley system, which on occasion was prone to backlash. Whereas the updated fourth axis uses a harmonic drive key box. Basically this means there's pretty much zero backlash. And on top of this, there's a new connector that goes into a new sealed port on the underside of the gantry. Another prototype problem was the seals failing and debris exiting the machine. Instead of stick on foam, we now have this dense plush carpet. Unlike the previous foam, this is not degraded and it's done a great job keeping the debris inside where it belongs. Furthermore, seals have been added to stop debris from falling through underneath the bed. All of this is fantastic because it's rare to see a Kickstarter improve rather than suffer from corner cutting by the time it gets to the customer. But there's another change that's even more important. And that's finally the release of Makehera Cam, their in-house CNC software. The thing about this Makehera Cam software is that it has been promised since the end of 2022. And from the start of this year has had a flurry of updates. So the following is my feedback on how hardware and software integrate together. Most of which I've already sent directly to Makehera. Downloading the software is simple from either the website or their GitHub. You simply need to select the installer for the operating system you're running. An important note, the software is free, but it's free for those who have purchased a Carvera machine. You'll need to enter details that match your order. And if you don't have these, you can still trial the product for 15 days. When it comes to resources, I have to give massive props to Makera for the work they've done. On YouTube, they have a really long playlist, but the videos are quite short and targeted. So if there's something particular you'd like to learn, you can simply go through the playlist and watch a specific video in minutes dedicated to that particular skill without having to wade through a really long tutorial. On the Makera Wiki, there's also a really good user guide. It covers every function in the software and will explain what every single setting and input field does. 
Again, this is very thorough. My only complaint is that the text from the wiki should be present as tooltips when you hover over any particular field, as that stops the need to switch out of the software and back to the website. Here we can see what I'm talking about in AugaSlicer, and this additional little step would make the user experience a whole lot smoother. It's also worth mentioning that there's a very active Discord where announcements are made and people can seek help if needed. As soon as you open the program, you're given a choice between 3-axis and 4-axis. The layout seems pretty standard and intuitive. We have our usual file, edit, and so forth menus across the top, and then we have some functions grouped into buttons, things like file management, importing, object manipulation and creation, and then specific functions for creating toolpaths. I have one huge complaint and that is camera control. In short, you cannot easily manipulate the camera by using the mouse. The most efficient way to do it is to drag down on the cube in the lower left. If you hold down the right mouse and drag, instead you'll get a context menu. And the only other option we have is to set the left mouse button to rotate instead. This lets us spin the camera, but we won't be able to click and select anything until we come back up to this menu and put it back to select. However, as you can see, this is buggy, and it wasn't until I pressed the keyboard shortcut that I was able to select again. Pretty much every CAD and CAM program will let you use the right mouse to rotate the camera, and then when you click it, you can still have a context menu. My CaraCam, in my opinion, desperately needs a way for you to set what you want to happen when you click and drag with the right mouse button. The current workflow is far too clunky, and honestly, it drove me crazy. Next, I imported an STL and got to work. It was pretty easy to click it and then come up to the menu to then transform it and rotate it and all of the preset buttons to move things 90 degrees were welcome. You will notice here that the stock does not automatically adjust to the object that you've imported. So you'll need to come up to the corner, click to edit this, set your material and then use trial and error to shrink the stock down. But then after you've done that, you'll probably have to come back and move it into position once more. The quick align stock tool does help here, but I still find this aspect clunkier than it could be. It's good to be able to set your stock, but I'd like to have the option like in Kirimoto, where I can tick offset, and then specify a width and depth. Now whatever I import, the stock will automatically resize to match, adding that margin around the outside for the cutter. The most efficient workflow I've found for this system is to select the object, press S for scale, get the size, and then come up and edit the stock, making it just a little bit bigger than the object. But in the interests of being more efficient by saving clicks, I think there's room for improvement here particularly when I found a bug in the early version where changing the stock or moving the object would not move the toolpaths to the new location despite recalculating everything. The next surprise I had was trying to machine a pocket and by that I mean a partial depth cut to create a feature on the top surface. I selected the tool for a 3D pocket but I couldn't find any way to select the geometry and any time I click calculate I'd get an error saying no model mesh selected. After doing some reading, I discovered that this program prefers step files for some geometries at least. So I had to go back into my CAD and export the file again. They really could do with a warning here to prevent user frustration. Now the surfaces were selectable and I could click the one I wanted and calculate the toolpath. So these quirks were annoying me, but it was at this stage I found the first excellent reason to switch to this CAM software. And that's the extensive tool and material library that matches everything that comes with the router as well as the extras that Carvera sell. You can first select a category and then find your specific cutter and then select a like material. When you hit choose, all of these settings will be transported over as a starting point at least. Most CAM softwares will let you input custom tools. My Kera Cam lets you do this too, but having this extensive library to start with is very welcome. Next up, I wanted to cut around the outside of my part. So I selected my object and played with the generate contours button. This will trace the outlines, which you can then select holding shift to select more than one for a single operation. But as you can see, some color coding would go a long way here. So you don't have to constantly hide previous toolpaths to see what you're doing. All of the settings here for feeds and speeds are exactly what you'd expect if you used a cam software. And I was pleased to see that the ramping strategy was a lot more detailed than what I was used to. That's another toolpath successfully created and a job ready to go. Again, clarity is somewhat of an issue here. You can turn off the individual toolpaths, but everything is still color coded white. This is on par with other CAM programs, but what's really good in things like Kirimoto and just your 3D printer slicer is you have a slider so you can start from the beginning and make sure everything is happening in the order that you intend. A similar type of functionality would be very welcome here. One thing that Kirimoto does very well, especially since it's free, is offering toolpath visualization. You can simulate the toolpath and then get a good idea what the final object is going to look like. This is something that in the latest release has been added for 3D toolpaths at least. 
Once the blue bar fills up, you can hit start, watch the machining happening in real time, or speed up or even skip to the end to see the final product. This is a really important tool in the workflow, particularly for beginners, to make sure what they've input actually matches the output. Once we're ready to go, we can come up to export and we tick all of the tool paths we want to be included. And there's a no brainer for what needs to be added here. And that's an estimate of the time each is going to take as well as the total time. That's the basics, but now let's move on to some more specific workflow. Previously, for any job I was machining on the Carvera, I was manually cutting my own threads afterwards. But my carer have these thread milling bits that I was very keen to try out. So I modeled up this simple test piece where I would cut an M4 internal thread and then leave behind this stud that would get an M4 external thread. Now, if we come to the tool library, we can see that for M4, we need a 3.3 millimeter diameter hole. So that was easy to model in, but for the external thread, I just went with four millimeters, which was a guess. The job contains six tool paths, a pocket to remove the material on top, a contour to clear out this bore, the internal and external threads. And this is pretty simple as you just need to select the M4 tool and then all of the parameters will be matched. I also wanted to try out the chamfer bit to take the edge of this boss. And then finally a contour to cut the whole part out, but I didn't add tabs, which bit me later on. As for the material, I went for 12 mil thick acrylic so we can see inside to those threading operations. The pocketing pass was straightforward and the built-in ramping reduces the chances of any bits breaking. And after that, I put in the M4 threading tool and watching it was quite interesting. It went right to the bottom and then spiraled upwards following the path of a helix to cut the thread on the inside. The external thread was much the same, starting at the bottom and then following a helix around the outside to cut the thread. The chamfering pass seemed to go well. I asked for a depth of 0.5 millimeters and this was applied around the outside of the cylinder as well as the opening to the M4 thread. And then finally the contour pass to cut everything out, which started great, but since there was no tabs provided, at the end the part came loose and had a giant chunk taken off. Let's test our threads and the internal M4 thread that I modeled to carve various specifications turned out really well. However, the external thread, it seems my stud was a little bit wide because I was just shooting in the dark. I think this application is rare, but I still think it could be improved by modeling in the correct dimensions. As for the rest, it's a clean job and I'm happy with the result. So can we replicate one of the 3D reliefs as seen in the demonstration files? A great way to do this is to get an image of Sam Prentice use a free online site to convert it into a lithophane, import and resize that in Maker Cam, and set up a 3D relief to zigzag across the surface, cutting out his likeness. For this one, I used a ball nose cutter with a 0.25 millimeter gap between the passes. This image was sized at 140 by 82 millimeters with a Z depth of three millimeters and the job took around 90 minutes to complete. And because I use plywood, we get different colors at different depths, which gives an outcome as novel as the man himself. You can imagine this on a plain piece of timber would be a great way to customize a box or piece of furniture. If you've purchased the optional laser add-on, well that's handled by my camera cam as well. You once again import your image and size it, and then from the laser path options, you can either trace vectors or engrave an image. To get the right settings, it's worth visiting the wiki for feeds and speeds, which you can then import to convert your image into a raster pattern. When you start the job, the same probe is still used to trace out the path, before touching down to measure the top of the material. You're then prompted to fit the laser module as if it was a CNC cutter, plugging it in at the top. And if you're using Air Assist, there's a little tube to connect it to the external system. The laser touches down on the tool probe so it can get the exact focal length right. And then the engraving work follows with this job taking around 30 minutes. Of course, this is just a simple example and you could combine laser with CNC cutting and engraving operations if you wanted to another fine result, and another opportunity for me to preach Sam Prentice. Previously, I had this simple PCB I put together based on a design by Chep from Filament Friday. I'd never exported to Gerbers before, so I followed the first guide that I could find on Google, and that seemed to work well as the geometry imported correctly. From here, I set up a trace of the track edges using a V-bit tool, an internal contour to cut out all of the holes, and then a final contour with tabs to cut out the exterior of the PCB. The toolpath preview looked exactly how I expected, so I started the job and reminded myself that the auto leveling system on these is great for thin materials like this, because if there's a slight bow, it will be accounted for and the traces will still be cut to the correct depth. This job completed very smoothly without incident, but I did note that there's an opportunity to add the name of the tool, which is already in the G-code comments on the tool change dialog, and I think that would make things a little bit slicker. 
I always get nervous about these tiny bits snapping, but the suggested feeds and speeds in my Kara cam were spot on, and it wasn't long before the PCB was cut out and ready. Now I had to keep this one simple as I was doing some things for the first time, but the workflow was very easy to understand, and it would be easy now to scale this up to harder projects. Probably the aspect that I was by far the most excited to try out was the fourth access machining, because cam packages that support this are rare and expensive. And previously I paid for a license of Desproto. The multi-access addition to use the fourth axis is just under a thousand euros for commercial users and for hobbyists and educators 250 euros. With this context you can understand the tremendous value on offer if customers can create four axis jobs for free. But how well does it actually work? Let's find out. After we select four axis job the first thing we need to do again is import our stock. And you'll see here we have square or round options. By selecting round we're working with the outer bounds, but by selecting square, we're working with a piece of material that matches the inner bounds. My test model is this chess piece from No Way K47, and we're aiming for two operations, a roughing pass to remove most of the material, followed by a much finer finishing pass to get out the details. After importing the STL and setting the stock, you can use the creation tools to add cylinders at the top and bottom to support the model. And this is handy because you don't need to do it in CAD. From here we add a rotation relief toolpath, going for relatively aggressive settings and giving a depth allowance of half a millimetre which is going to leave a skin behind. Here is a preview of the toolpath and I set the direction to horizontal so the cutter will go from left to right across the model and rotate it between each pass. I then added another rotation relief operation, this time selecting an engraving bit, changing the cutting direction to vertical which is better for details and removing that depth allowance to cut right up to the surface of the STL. And as we can see from the toolpath preview, we have a series of fine passes rotating around the object to get that detail. Now this is where it will be great to cycle through all of the toolpaths, and we don't have a preview available yet for fourth axis jobs. I'm told that's not far away, and I hope so because it's really vital. Now initially I had a mishap where the roughing and detail passes were not aligned, and I had to stop the job early. But it turns out this was my fault, as I hadn't updated the controller or the firmware versions, and quite a lot of fixes had been made to how the fourth axis operates. After updating, when I ran the same job again, everything was aligned and the job completed properly. For me, this is a really outstanding result, matching the quality seen on the demonstration job prepared by MakeHera. If I can get something like this on my first attempt, then the software is good and things will only get better. And I think this is a good summary of where this is at. Users could always get great results using the pre-prepared G-code that came with the tutorial kit. And now with the release of Makara Cam, finally, users can replicate those results without spending money on additional software and without a particularly steep learning curve. I was already a fan of these Carvera CNC's because they're as easy and clean to use as a 3D printer within my studio space. But now, even with some clear room for improvement, the addition of Makara Cam is a very welcome step. It's good enough already that I'm switching to it for all of my ongoing projects, but it can truly be great if the feedback I've outlined is adopted Pretty please, starting with some proper mouse camera control. Let me know what you think about this machine and the new software down in the comments section. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy CNC machining. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.